Welcome back to Megan Fox Investigates. I write with pjmedia.com and I'm back with part two. I'm still in my fluffy robe. I'm on cup two of coffee and it's pretty good. And you're going to need something strong to get through the rest of this article in Vulture that I've been reading um, where the writers of Anne Just Like That are just desperately trying to justify everything they did to our characters and it's pretty gross so shall we get to shall we get back to it um we are going to when carrie met Seema. now just to let you know i have not read the rest of this article yet so all of my reactions will be genuine <laughs> and immediate uh so here it is when carrie met Seema. Of the new characters, one favorite has been Seema Patel, a fast-talking real estate agent played by Sarita Chudre, who befriends Carrie after Big's death and in Diwali takes her to meet her overbearing parents. Rachna says, The Indian community is a vast diaspora, but we made the choice to make Seema what I am, which is Gujarati, and to have the last name Patel which is my maiden name, and to have her be from Queens, which is where I was born. Oh, so again, again, they're not writing characters, they're writing the writers. Again, this is about the writers. It's all, these people are so full of themselves, it's incredible. But as with every character, there's as much of each of the writers in SEMA as there is in me, ultimately. I know that from the little audience response I had to be confronted with because people tagged me. People were like, we're doing the trope where the parents want her to get married. But a 50-year-old Gujarati woman from Queens, that's going to be part of her life. We open up, really, even after she can't have children anymore? Don't Indian parents give up at some point? Isn't the whole point of getting your kids married off so that you get grandchildren? I mean, when that's not a possibility anymore, it, what's the purpose? Anyway, moving on. We open on her dad watching a Knicks game, which is how my dad was. So again, it's not about Seema, not about Seema's parents. It's about Rachna's parents and Rachna's life. As if any of us really care what Rachna's life is like. I mean, sorry, Rachna, you're probably a nice girl, but nobody tuned in to see your life. We tuned in to see what happened to the characters in Sex in the City. That's it. Um, I don't dislike Seema. I never did. I thought that she's a decent character, but they never did anything with her story. All right, moving on. The word we settled on for Seema early was effervescent. One of the inspirations for having that episode, instead of being Christmas or another holiday, was because Diwali is the festival of lights, and we played with the idea of light and dark, and it being a dark moment in Carrie's life. Seema could have been friends with Carrie earlier, but it's important that, in a way, Seema is a person who only knows Carrie after Big, and that's kind of beautiful. Does it strike you as strange, audience, listening to this, that... Rajna, who says Seema is, you know, based on her, doesn't know the difference between, you know, doesn't know what a uh, correct sari is because didn't they screw up the sari? They said Carrie was wearing a sari, but that's not what it was. It seems like a pretty big detail for um, someone with an Indian background to miss, but I don't know. It just isn't that why you hire people who have knowledge of the stuff you're writing about? All right, the one where all the new friends meet. It isn't until episode nine, no strings attached, credited to King, Zeritsky, and Rottenberg, that Seema, Charlotte's mom, friend, Lisa Todd Wexley, and Miranda's professor, Nia Wallace, all converge on the same location. Um, Rot Julie Rottenberg says, we very much wanted to get them together, but in due time. We wanted to get there organically. Michael, Elisa, and I have all have separate lives and friends who haven't all met. Michael Patrick King says, it took us a while because by the time LTW meets Naya, the audience has finally gotten a grasp of who they are. If we had to put them together in episode two because of some contrivance, the audience wouldn't even understand what that means. There's the idea that Naya is dressed one way and LTW is dressed another. And then you have Miranda judging LTW, but LTW saves the day for Naya. It's richer because it took time to get there. I don't know. Did anybody notice Miranda judging LTW? I didn't. I mean, I, I don't know if they thought they made a big deal out of that. They didn't. I didn't notice it. Uh, 
Rajna says there's a lunch scene earlier in the season where Seema is there with the other three girls. And we knew those are moments where people are going to have visceral reactions because it's not Samantha. Whoever is in that seat. Well, personally, I just thought it was good the seat was filled because to me it was like a hole in the in the scene to have three chairs and one empty. We also had scenes with just Naya and Andre Rashad disjointed from our main characters. And then the painting scene could pay that off too. It was about giving the new characters their own space in the series so that as we move forward, they're a part of it. Except they never get anywhere. Those stories never went anywhere. And as you move forward, where are you going? Where is this going? You're going to season two? Everyone hates this shit. Don't do it. I mean, selfishly, I'm going to be like, all right, here we go. Um, you know, people love watching us hate watch this. So I'll do it as long as they give it to us. But for what purpose? Like this is this is career destroying stuff. And like all of these people are signing up for it again. I don't know. I hope not. Easy. Who's easy? Oh, Alisa. Alisa Zuritsky. A scene in Kelly Goff's episode, episode four, some of my best friends which was the worst, most racist shit you ever saw, that we worked hard to refine was a motherhood conversation between Naya and Miranda. These new friends, who nobody could understand why they were friends in the first place, would have to bond in a short amount of time, and we had to figure out how to get them sitting at a table, opening up this intimate conversation. We had to come up with the conflict with the host at the restaurant first to destabilize Naya. What? The conflict with the host at the restaurant? You know, maybe I'm just not even remembering these. I've tried to block them out at this point. I don't remember a conflict with the host at the restaurant. Do you? I don't know. Let me know in the comments below if you remember this conflict with the host at the restaurant. Uh, Julie and I are mothers, and Kelly has chosen not to have kids. We wanted Miranda to give Naya permission and advice about motherhood that we never heard before. We were mothers that we never heard before we were mothers. We wanted Miranda to impart wisdom based on reality. Well, what does that mean? We, why does Miranda have to give Naya permission for anything? And would you take advice about motherhood from Miranda Hobbs? Honest to God, especially now that you've seen the specific type of shit that Brady became, <laughs> why would anyone take parenting advice from Miranda Hobbs. And why would Naya need her permission to have kids or not have kids? I don't need any other woman's permission to make my family decisions. That is between me and my husband, period. Like what? I don't understand this at all. And again, this is the writer's own guilt. See, one of them, Kelly, has chosen not to have kids. And so they have to have this big discussion between the writers about people who are mothers and people who are not mothers and that there's this big somehow thing there when in reality there's nothing. There's no judgment at all on people who don't have kids or who choose not to have kids. Like who's running around judging people who don't have kids and who feels like they must ask permission from other women in order to not have children? That's it's stupid. And this is one of the reasons why we have these scenes where we're all going, what the hell are we even watching? Because no one does this in real life. No one asks for permission from other women to have kids or not. Like this is just obscene and absurd. <sighs> I'm getting a headache. This is not how I wanted to start my morning. This is such a long article, you guys. Oh my God. The thing isn't even halfway down the screen. Do you see over here? Look at look at how much further we have to go. We were way up here and we have to go way down here. I am just, uh, okay. All right. Maybe I need more caffeine. I'm trying to steady myself. These people make me so mad. Charlotte and Miranda learn a lesson. Oh, because that's what everybody wants. That's just what everybody wanted was to learn lessons while we watch a Sex in the City reboot. Because that's why we watched Sex in the City in the first place, right? To learn lessons. <laughs> oh, God. These people. Please stop trying to teach me something. I'm 40 fucking five. Like, I, I don't. I'm going to teach you something is what's happening here. I'm going to teach these writers to never do this shit again. How about that? Let's teach them a lesson. 
<sighs> okay, I'm going to try to get through this. I know I promised you that I was going to read this, but we are only 40% of the way through this article. And I'm having difficulties. <laughs> and I'm seriously getting a headache. I need to take something. Over the course of the season, the show returns to Miranda and Charlotte's awkwardness in talking about race and gender. Miranda trips over herself trying to prove to Naya that she's a good white woman who read White Fragility. Oh, Jesus. Help me. Lord, help me. I need your strength. Charlotte is embarrassed about her lack of black friends after befriending LTW and initially doesn't understand her child Rock's need to ex express her gender identity. She comes around to organizing a they mitzvah by the, fi by the finale. Michael Patrick King says, The idea for us was the human foible of someone trying to do their best. The base code of every faux pas was that everyone was always trying to say the thing they hoped was the right thing, which is why most of the time we stepped into the arena. It had an overview of comedy or of yikes. Yeah, definitely. It was a big yikes. Yep, you got that right. They're all trying to do their best to stay current in a time when current is changing. That's why, you know what, Michael Patrick King? That's why the right thing to do is not give a fuck what anyone thinks what you think. That's the right thing to do. The right thing to do is to say what you say, think what you think, say it out loud, and never apologize for it. You know why? Because this is a fucking free country. The First Amendment still applies, even between people of different races, okay? <laughs> like, if you don't like it, change the channel. Don't talk to the person anymore. Cut off the friendship if you have to. But for God's sake, Back the fuck off of telling everybody what they have to say or can't say or should say. Seriously, just fuck off because we, we, I, I don't want this anymore. No one wants this anymore. The only people who want speech policed like this are the speech police themselves. The people who are right now defining what we can and cannot say in America. And I'm here to tell you that you can fuck right off with that. Because this is America. And until they put me in jail, I'm going to say what I think. And that means I'm going to say that uh, Che Diaz is a woman. And it's clear to everyone that that's a woman. And I'm not going to use uh, plural pronouns to describe a singular person. I will not bastardize the English language to, um, to satisfy the desires of an attention whore. I won't do that. Don't be an attention whore. Or don't listen to me. Like if that, if that offends you and that triggers you right now, those of you who are going to leave things in the comments to say that it's just so horrible that I would misgender someone, leave this channel. It's very, very simple. Click off, go somewhere else. <laughs> like it's, this is a free country and you do not have the right to not be offended at every moment of your life. If something offends you, walk away from it. Walk away. And I would have walked away from this damn show, except that all of you are here expecting and wanting to hear what we have to say about it from a different perspective. And you know what? That's valuable. And that's why I won't walk away from this show, because it has brought up so many issues that we really need to talk about. The discussion and the dialogue that needs to happen is this one right here. Is this one right here, this attack on free speech, this I will not stand for. I will up with this. I will not put <laughs> trying to avoid prepositions at the end of my sentences. All right. We're never going to get through this. I'm getting, Oh, I, I forgot to give a little for my uh, political soapbox. That was my political soapbox moment. And I'm going to get back down off of it now. And I'm going to keep moving through this article again, uh, as public service announcement. If you disagree with me, you're still welcome on this channel, unless you're going to leave mean comments. Uh, we can certainly get along and talk about other things that we like. All right. The idea. Oh, Samantha Irby says, in terms of media and entertainment, we either get that the parent is all in and knows all the terms and does everything right, or the opposite end of the spectrum where the parent is like, get out of my house. Hmm? I think that for most progressive people, it's like, oh, I'll do it, but I'm sort of annoyed that I have to learn new things. I loved watching, oh, that's, uh, I don't know how I feel about that. I feel like Never mind. Let's just move on. I loved watching Charlotte and Harry slowly get on the level. 
We always knew it was going to be fine and that Charlotte was going to do the work, but it was valuable to a certain segment of the show's audience to see someone mirror themselves back to them. Do the work. I hate that phrase, do the work. What work? What work did Charlotte actually do besides make an asshole out of herself, running around trying to invite Black people she did not know to her dinner party? What work did she do? What? Because frankly, I think she looks like a racist asshole. I didn't, I didn't see her do any work to, to get past that. The only thing I did like was sitting down with LTW and finally saying, you know what? I was kind of an asshole. I tried to impress you by inviting black people to my party because I thought you needed to see that. And then LTW was able to say, I, I was embarrassed. I didn't have any white people at my party. And so the two of them were like being honest with each other for once. All of that other shit was dishonesty. It was total dishonesty. And I don't think Charlotte did any work. What what work? What work? Did she go to a um like what kind of work are you supposed to do to get past your your supposed alleged racism that Samantha Irby thinks you harbor inside your soul? What is the work that you need to do? Uh you have to read White Fragility because that's a bullshit book. It's a racist book and you could have your opinions on that. I don't, you know, whatever. I think it's racist, you might not. Um, I just hate all of this so much. And then, uh, why can I never remember what JR stands for? Rottenberg, right? We wanted to let them be human. And I think we're all in the room willing to admit to horrible faux pas and realize we're saying things and having horrible encounters where people were like, oh my God, did I just say that? Yeah. I don't think normal people do that all the time. I, I literally can live years of my life years of my life without having a horrible encounter where I think, did I just say that? Like I, I, I think before I open my mouth and I say what I mean, and I'm not embarrassed of what I said. <laughs> so everything I've said, uh, I'm, I have no apologies to make because I have thought out what my opinions are over many years and they don't change. <sighs> Samantha Irby. With Miranda, it's also her fumbling with having read White Fragility and trying to apply those lessons into her life. That scene in the classroom where you have a well-intentioned white woman regurgitating all the articles or Instagram graphics she's read and seeing the reaction of the person she's talking to being like, ah, uh, you don't have to save me. Yeah, well, that's what you get, though, when you, when you teach people and what we have been taught over the last few years by the mainstream media and the corporate press and everything else is that you must stand up for people of color when you see something bad happening, which I always assumed, uh, I always thought you stand up for people in general, you know, be a good neighbor and the good Samaritan, all of that, that we were taught that in church when I was a little girl. Um, and it doesn't, depend on the color of one's skin. But if you see something wrong happening to someone, you're supposed to say something. I'm all for that. Like, I'm all for that. Then we have the new woke rules where it's said that white people need to use their privilege to stand up for black people. So Miranda tries to do this. She tries. She thinks she thinks that it's a racist issue that uh, the professor is being asked for her ID. And she tries to follow the new rules and only to get slapped down to be told that she's doing this white savior thing. So you can't win. White people can't win. If you stand up for someone uh, who you think is having trouble, you can be also accused of being a white savior. There is no winning with these people, which is why you have to ignore them and everything they say and just live your life based on the golden rule. Treat others the way you would like to be treated. That's all you need to know. That's it. That's how you live your life, period. Okay. Uh, Eliza Zeritsky says the old series was a festival of mortification. These women dating were usually the butt of the joke. What? And stepping into some kind of horror show of their own making. Did you get that feeling when you were watching Sex in the City that the women were the butt of the joke? I didn't. I mean, they were able to laugh at themselves and there were some, you know, there were some embarrassing situations. I mean, the whole the thing about the fart, that was very funny. Very, very funny. Um, but that actually led to a really good plot twist where we get to know Big and he starts to get to know her. And we find out that while she's like, Carrie's like pushing him away, 
she thinks she's trying to get closer to him, but really she's never even invited him up to her apartment. So how close to him was she really trying to be? Um, you know, anyway, I didn't think that it was a, a festival of mortification. That's what they turned it into. All right, moving on. We as writers are almost are most amused by our own foibles. So we gave them foibles in today's world and had them step in it sometimes, especially as white people tend to do, even when they're otherwise well-intentioned. That is so racist. Sorry, Eliza Zaritsky, but that's racist. Are you generalizing an entire race of people? Are you generalizing all white people tend to do that they step in it all the time? Like what? Imagine exchanging the words white people for black people and, and read that sentence again and what the reaction would be. I dare you. All right. Samantha Irby. One of the big back and forths was a scene where Charlotte wanted to impress LTW and have her kids over for a sleepover. And we were pitching all this insane stuff that could happen. One pitch we landed on was that the kids would give Charlotte's dog a bath and Lisa's little daughter was going to get her hair wet. That's probably a played out thing that a white lady doesn't know how to do black hair, but it would have been funny. Oh my God. These people's idea of funny is just insane. If we get another season, maybe we're going to have Charlotte watching a YouTube video on how to do little Gabrielle's hair. Oh God. Please don't do season two. Please, please. About that Chucky subway assault. How much time are we, where are we at with this? Oh my God. I'm at 20 minutes again, and we're still not done with this. They did come up with a wild, one wild way for Naya and Miranda to bond. In the show's second episode, a man dressed as Chucky steals Naya's purse on a subway platform, and Miranda hits him over the head with her textbooks. Samantha Irby said, Michael, Julie, and Elisa are New York supremacists. I don't love New York. Maybe I'm too Midwestern. I had seen a video of a person in a Chucky costume attacking people on the subway on Twitter, so I sent it to the writer's room email. Like, this is your precious fucking city. And the next day in the room, Michael was like, I loved that Chucky video. Do you want to put it in the show? It almost got cut for time. But Michael was like, no, no, we're doing Chucky, of course, because it was so dumb. They had to. Miranda goes to Che Lafornia. By way of an impromptu performance of California Girls in an overcrowded club, Che suddenly reveals to Miranda in the finale that Che is moving to California to shoot a pilot. Against the advice of her professor, Naya, and even after an argument with Carrie, Miranda decides to give up a competitive internship and follow Che there. And after announcing she'd never dye her hair in the premiere, Miranda emerges from her brownstone with her hair dyed red in her final scene of the season. They mean in a red wig because her hair was not dyed red. She was wearing an awful red wig. Michael Patrick King says, we moved the pieces of this decision up to the very end. We actually had the very last, very, the very fast last breaking thought that Miranda would go to California. It became part of the writing to decide, does Miranda claim her old self or her new self? The old self would have stayed and taken care of Brady and chosen the internship. We even had a line where Miranda went, I just remembered I'm Miranda, not Rambo. But we looked at it and went, why? We built the entire season around the fact that she's feeling something out of her head and in her body and heart. Why would we change that? That opened up the conversation to the last speech in the choice of red hair. You know what, Michael Patrick King? The fact that you are telling people that they should follow their heart and their, their body instead of their minds, that's a problem. Anybody who tells you that uh, does not care about you or the choices that you're making. Uh, they just like to watch a train wreck because following your heart and your body is a recipe for disaster. And as a mother, as a parent, I always tell my children to follow their brain. Listen, think, think. Think before you do what you're doing. You think before you put that Sharpie marker on my wall. You better think before you make that decision. Don't, don't just decide to do what your body wants to do and color all over my wall with a Sharpie marker because you'll be in trouble for that. Who, seriously, who raised these people? That's what I want to know. Eliza Zariski says the three of us, Michael, Elisa, and Julie, realized that she didn't have a punctuation mark on her story, and I threw out on a last-minute meeting that we were having on location. What if she dyes her hair back? We had a debate about what messages that would send to people who have natural gray hair and if we were betraying her real roots, so to speak. 
Oh God, it's way too late, Eliza, to worry about betraying Miranda's real roots. You, you blew far past that. We're way past that. Wow. MPK, why are you bringing that line now to Vulture? We could have used that. Used what? What if she done? We had a, I don't even know what he's saying. Used what? Um, Eliza Zariski says, but I felt strongly that she shouldn't always have to be judging herself. I felt like we were suddenly the voices in her head going, what message are you going to send? I feel like part of adulthood and growth is throwing off those voices that are keeping you from doing what might be the thing you have the right to do. You have the right to destroy your family? Is that what these people are saying? That you have the right to cheat on your husband? You have a right to blow up your life and leave your son and not take care of your son? You have a right to do these things? Would they ever write a man like this and expect people to stand up and cheer for a man leaving his wife and children? Oh, hell, no, they wouldn't. This is so, oh, uh, it's misandry. And it's so obvious. Uh, Julie Rottenberg says, in a way, choosing to have her go to L.A., and change her hair back is messy. And these women's lives are messy. And that's what we wanted to embrace. To not have it follow a clear linear step A, step B, step C. That is also why it's a heated conversation around these characters. MPK says in the other series, a lot of the knockdown drag out Carrie and Miranda fights were about Miranda's opinion of Carrie throwing herself away for big. The exciting thing for us now is that she's using Carrie as a mirror to beat herself up about what she's choosing to do. I don't, she's not beating herself up about anything. Team Steve. Before Miranda goes off with Chase, she breaks up with Steve. As the state of their marriage became one of the most hotly contested storylines of the season, it spawned a sizable contingent of pro Steve support online. Miranda tells Steve everything in episode eight, Bewitched, Be Bothered, be bothered. Bewitched, bothered, and bewildered, credited to fruit, fruit bomb. Rochna says, I am amicably, amic, amicably divorced. I don't know why I can't say that word today. I'm amicably divorced and have feelings about how divorce can be portrayed in the media. It was heartbreaking to write the scene where Miranda breaks things to Steve. We wanted to give Steve his strength and his comedy in it and Miranda hers and make it feel two-sided. We wanted to give Steve the agency to be like, I thought this is what we were doing and have Miranda be like, there's 30 more years of our lives. We put into each of their mouths to me, and I know other people didn't feel this way, valid points. We wanted to balance it out so that Steve doesn't feel like just a meek mouse that got run over by a truck. <sighs> I don't know. I don't know what to say to that. You all saw it. You know. Julie Rottenberg says the Steve Miranda breakup was going to be a biggie. I believed what we were doing was true to the character in the moment where she's getting in touch with the fact that she's unhappy with her marriage. I believed in that, supported it, thought it was ready for the thought I was ready for the response and definitely was not. People were invested in them as a couple. You didn't know that? Come on. Elisa and I were joking recently that it was like they were all the children of Miranda and Steve. Elisa Zaritsky, they were all babies. It's not like it's their fault. Oh, so now we're babies. Okay. Mm hmm. Julie Rottenberg said it was like mom and I have come to a place where we just don't make it. You didn't do anything wrong. You're disappointed. We know that desperate outrage and the justice for Steve and all that. I loved how heartfelt that is, but I was not fully prepared. Well, you should have been. If you had known these characters and known how much the fans were invested in the show, you should have been prepared. And you, it's like saying you didn't know how the audience was going to react to killing big. Come on. Lisa says, I will say there are viewers out there who are really happy about that too. Who? There's like five people. Five? Maybe five? Five viewers? You did all this to make five people happy? Rachna says, I had a really strong drive to be as clear as we could that Miranda deciding to leave Steve wasn't about Che. Yes, it was. But was about her trying to make a change in her life. Che was a symptom of where she was, but not the reason for the action necessarily. Well, I don't think they did a good job showing that because it all seemed about Che. Miranda was already in a place where her marriage was not feeling full. So in the writer's idea, when your marriage is not feeling full, it's okay to cheat on your husband, leave your marriage, leave your kid and destroy people's lives and just move on. Mm -hmm. 
Samantha Irby said, with Miranda and Steve, what would we watch them do together? Steve already had an affair. He was already a loser who didn't have money. <gasps> I can't believe she said that. He owns a bar, Samantha Irby. He is a bar owner and the bar didn't go under. So that means that he's successful. What do you mean a loser who didn't have money? That is such, and if he didn't have money, that doesn't make him a loser. Oh my God. I can't believe she said that. Moving on. What would you tune in for next week? I understand reacting to beloved characters doing things you don't want, but I think people also don't want the alternative, which is just a show of people eating food and being like, my life's great. Oh my God. This is the whole problem. Samantha Irby is the problem. She is the poison that was injected into the show. I mean, all of them are bad. Rachna, of course, had to write in her own divorce. So that's why Steve and Miranda are kaput. And Samantha Irby thinks Steve's a loser who doesn't have money. Wow. Wow. That solidifies to me that Samantha Irby was not, she didn't really watch Sex and the City. She can say all day long that she owns the VHS tapes and was um, obsessively watching them, but I don't believe her anymore. No. MPK said, when we were in the original series, that was bumpy too. The first season, first two seasons, people were like, no. At first they were just dating the show, but then there were small devoted camps that eventually became a love affair. There are all sorts of bumps if you're going to do something you haven't said before or you're doing something that people care about. But if you're with the right group of writers, you get a feeling that it has nothing to do with a critical eye. For us, the outside wave is not part of the process. Of course not. Of course it isn't. He doesn't care. But we allow the wave to do its thing. We're the wave. Do the wave. There's supposed to be a certain amount of danger to writing if you're trying to do something that has not been done. So he doesn't care about the he doesn't care about the wave. We are the wave. We are the wave, the tidal wave crashing over this uh, group of writers who thinks they are literally the best thing since sliced bread. They believe they're the best writers uh, on planet Earth and that what they've done is terrific. And I'm out of here because 32 minutes is way too long. I hope you enjoyed it. I can't believe if you're still here, drop 100 in the comments so I know you made it. And um, I'll be back later, I'm sure. Don't forget to like and subscribe and stay tuned for Friday because I'm going to have some really great collaborations going on. Friday, 5 p.m. happy hour, live chat, uh, premiering video here on my channel uh, with Real Housewives recaps and uh, perhaps a few others. So stay tuned. All right. Bye-bye.